Good morning, students. I hope everybody is up and awake and ready to roll. We've got a lot to talk about today, and this class is going to be fun because it's the class you voted for in our poll. So good morning to you all. Earlier, I normally start off by greeting each one of you individually, but unfortunately, I had computer glitches, and I was unable to do that. What a bummer. So before we... Um, before we get started on the class, a couple of topics I want to cover. First is going to be the upcoming lessons. And I'm taking these off because now I can hear fine. It's going to be the upcoming lessons. Um, the forensic fossils and the prehistoric mammal fossils that you were part of your choice, those were within one vote away from each other at the time that I sat down and prepared for this this morning. So here are the upcoming subjects. This Friday, April 3rd, same time as this, the class will be on forensic fossils. That class, I'm going to teach you about how scientists use modern forensic science to help understand what these animals were. Because the vote was so close, Tuesday, April 7th, I am adding another class. Tuesday, April 7th, I'm going to do the prehistoric mammals class because it was so close. It was just too close. So I decided to add an extra class. That will be Tuesday, April 7th. All of this will be posted on the Dinosaur George Jr. page, and then we'll copy it over to our other social media. So both of these classes take place at the same one this time, which is 10 o'clock Central Time. We're in San Antonio, Texas, so 10 o'clock our time. And then if the quarantine is extended further, for Friday, the April, April the 10th, I am going to do a show, one of two shows. It's either going to be a show dedicated to the king of the dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus Rex, or it's going to be a show on animal adaptations, which was a show that was recommended to me by, um, uh, it was recommended to me by my friend Sandy, who mentioned it, and so... That may be the topic of a show if I do a fourth one. So, one more time. This Friday, April 3rd, I'm doing a show on forensic fossils. That show is same time as this one. Tuesday, April 7th, I am doing a show on prehistoric mammals. I've got some cool skulls I'll bring with me to show you. You'll be able to see some of them. And then on Friday, April the 10th, I'm either going to do a show on Tyrannosaurus rex or I'm going to do a show or a class on animal adaptations, one of the two. And that, and the one on Friday, April the 10th, is going to be in the event that they extend the quarantine. So I will keep all of you posted on all of that stuff, okay? I'll keep all of you posted. And one other question that came up that I want to answer again. Somebody said, what is the difference between the Dinosaur George Facebook page and the Dinosaur George Jr. Facebook page? Dinosaur George Jr. page is where these classes are, are shown live. Here's the difference between the two. Okay, the Dinosaur George page, a lot of that will tell you where I'm going to be, where my traveling museum is going to be. Now, obviously, we don't have a lot to say now, but we also copy over uh, articles on new discoveries. Um, Michelle and um, Alexis both will post different information on there. That gives you an idea of what we're doing. There's still information, but that's more to communicate with the PTAs, the PTOs, the schools, the organizations, and the groups. Now, the Dinosaur George, uh, the Dinosaur George Jr. page, which is this one that you're on right now, this page is nothing but information. Nothing but information. I don't talk about where I'm going to be. I only shoot short videos, and I would encourage you to go through this page and look because I have a bunch of short videos that are all information-based. All right. That's that. Let's get into the lesson plan. Class has begun. Today's lesson is on carnivores, on meat eaters. Now, remember in an earlier session, an earlier class where I taught you about the family grouping of how we group animals and dinosaurs into family groups. Well, here is a grouping of some of the sauropods, the theropods, the ornithopods, stegosaurs, and cotosaurs. Remember, we talked about these before. All right. Do any of you remember? the group how we divided them into two groups that had to do with their hips do you remember that the family groups this is all the different dinosaurs and some of the reptiles that they're related to the group that we're going to talk about today is the group that has the theropods and the sauropods 
And do you guys remember what that group was called? It is the Soriskians. That is correct. The Soriskians are who we're talking about today. And in the Soriskian group, which includes theropods and sauropods, we are talking about the theropods. And just to touch one more time on the Soriskian group, it, a Soriskian and Ornithischian has to do with your hip bones and how they are played or how they are set up in your body. The hip bones are comprised of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis bone. And the way they are set up, that's what puts you into this one family. So we are talking about the Soriskians. And in the Soriskian group, we're talking about the carnivores, the theropods, the meat eating dinosaurs. Now, these dinosaurs lived at a certain time. Do you remember what the era is that they were in? Do you remember that? It is the Mesozoic era. To be a theropod, what we're going to talk about today are the ones that lived in the Mesozoic era. And the Mesozoic era is broken into three different groups. The Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. There were meat-eating dinosaurs in all of them. So we're going to start off talking about the Triassic. Now, during the Triassic, this is a map of what the world looked like during the earliest part of the Triassic. All of the continents were connected together, and it was one gigantic continent called Pangaea. Now, dinosaurs could travel anywhere they wanted to at this time. They could go everywhere. You could walk from Africa to South America to North America to Europe to China to Russia to Antarctica to Australia. All of those continents were combined. Well, when dinosaurs first appeared, the meat-eating dinosaurs, most of them were relatively small. And here's an example of two of the smaller ones. Eoraptor, which is the one on the top, and then Eodromaeus, which is the one on the bottom. Now, these two are relatively small. They're about the same size. I know this picture makes them look like they're the same animals, but they're not. They were only about three feet long. And they had a full set of chompers. Listen, man, these guys were bad. Here is the skull of an Eoraptor. Take a look at the size of his little chomping teeth. There's his little head. And just an FYI so that you guys know, when you're looking at the skull of a dinosaur, there's a bunch of holes in its head. This first hole is the ear. The next one is the eye. The eye is always the second hole. That hole is there. That's called the antorbital fenestra. That's there to make the head light so his head doesn't weigh too much. And that's his nose down there. His eye is always the second hole, not this one, but this one. So this is little Eoraptor. Now, he's a small little dinosaur, but he's still a very dangerous little dinosaur. The other one I showed you, which is Eodromaeus, that may be the very first meat-eating dinosaur that ever existed. Eodromaeus may be the first meat-eating dinosaur that ever showed up on Earth. Both of these dinosaurs lived or lived in what is now South America, but that's where they started. Now, there were some bigger meat-eaters during that time. There were some larger theropods. Here's an example of a couple of them, Styricosaurus and Herrerasaurus. Herrerasaurus was the bigger of the two. He's about 13 feet long. It stands five, five and a half feet tall, so about the size of a relatively short man. It weighed 700 pounds. Now, that's pretty big. That's pretty big for us. That's pretty big for that time. At that particular time, Herrerasaurus was the largest theropod, the largest meat-eating dinosaur of its time. There were some bigger plant-eating dinosaurs at that time, but of the meat-eaters, Herrerasaurus was the smallest. So as you can see, Herrerasaurus still had all of the equipment that carnivores would have. He had those relatively sharp teeth. He had very sharp claws. And, you know, I wish I had a, a I have a skull of a Herrerasaurus. I just didn't have access to it. It's in, a, it's in a storage unit. But it's got really, really large teeth in the front and then smaller ones as it goes back. He's a very big, dangerous dinosaur. So if you were living at the time of the small ones like Eoraptor, Eodromaeus, Staricosaurus, or Herrerasaurus, you would have been in a lot of trouble because, listen, these were dangerous dinosaurs. They all are built basically the same way. They walked on two legs. They had a relatively stiff tail. 
They had relatively strong arms. They were small, but they were still relatively strong, and they had very, very sharp teeth. So in the Triassic, when you could walk anywhere, dinosaurs expanded and began to move all over the Earth. What allowed them to do that is their legs. Do you remember in the last class I taught you about the hip bones of a dinosaur? Well, one of the benefits of having legs that go straight up and down instead of out to the side, you can travel much easier, you're faster, you can move greater distances. And because dinosaurs were more like warm-blooded mammals instead of cold-blooded lizards, they didn't need to bask in the sun to warm up before they got going. So if there was a race during the Triassic period, the crocodiles and some of those animals can only race once they're warmed up. Dinosaurs, listen, they got little jet engines. Those little guys are out and about, and they're moving very, very quickly. And that allowed them to spread to areas all over the world. And this is how dinosaurs were able to ultimately take over the world, is their ability to travel and spread. So the Triassic, the carnivores, the theropods, start off relatively small, but then comes the Jurassic Age. Now, looking back at the Triassic map, and then jumping to the Jurassic, do you notice how the continents are beginning to break apart? The ocean is starting to move in. Well, that changed the environment dramatically because during the Triassic, in the center of the Triassic, of Pangaea, those areas, they don't get a lot of rain because by the time the clouds move in from the oceans that bring the rain, most of the rain is gone. So the center part may have been sort of difficult to live in. But as the continents began to break apart, rain was starting to go into new areas. Now, the dinosaurs could still travel. They could still travel during the early and mid part of the Jurassic. They could still walk from North America to Africa to South America to China. And this is why we find dinosaurs that look the same but live in two different areas, two different continents. It's because they were able to walk. So during the Jurassic, now life explodes as far as dinosaurs. The Jurassic is sort of like, think of the, think of the Triassic as a gallon of gas, and the Jurassic was the match that set it off because all of the sudden, all different kind of dinosaurs show up, and some of them are giants. The big long neck sauropods are showing up in the, the biggest ones are showing up in the Jurassic. And because of that, we have meat eating dinosaurs that are beginning to expand. So let's look at some of the oddities. And, and keep in mind, you guys, there's probably more than 200 different kinds of meat eating dinosaurs. There are, I only have so much time to talk about them. So I can only hand select certain few. So I wish I could just go through all of them, but I can't. So I've selected a few, and we're going to start with some of the oddballs. We're going to start with some of the crested dinosaurs, the meat eaters. First of all, the one on the right, Guan Long. Guan Long is one of the earliest ancestors of Tyrannosaurus rex. Doesn't look anything like a T-Rex, and it has that weird lumpy thing on his nose. That we don't know if he used it to make sound. We don't know if he used it to show, maybe it was brightly colored and it would could be used to communicate with other dinosaurs like, look at my color. I'm an adult. Stay away from me for the females. Hey, girls, look at my fancy head. Maybe you'll be attracted to me. That's probably what they were for. Guanlong is not very big. It's 10 feet long. If any of you have a tape measure available, if your mom or dad can get you a tape measure, Stretch it out and see how long 10 feet is, and it'll give you an idea of the size of this dinosaur. For those of you that use the metric system, I want you to convert the feet into meters, and then you do the same thing. Measure how long it is. So Guan Long is not giant. He's still a relatively big dinosaur, but he is not as big as you might think. Now, Monolophosaurus, the dinosaur picked it, pictured beside him, that dinosaur is 16 and a half feet long. So if you're going to measure Guan Long 10 feet, then measure next to him 16 and a half feet. Between now, you're talking about a dinosaur that weighs 1,000 pounds. So those two are some of the oddities, some of the strange ones. Let's look at another oddball, a big one. Now, this is Ceratosaurus. Ceratosaurus is a relatively large carnivore. 
Listen, he's 23 feet long. That's big. And the most interesting features about Ceratosaurus is that it has the big bump on the end of his nose and then two horns over its eyes. Again, I don't think those are used for fighting because they're not very thick. They're not very heavy. They look like they could be broken relatively easily. So I don't believe they're using that head as a fighting or a weapon uh, tool. I don't think they're using it for that. I believe, like I described about some of the other ornamentation on dinosaurs, that bump on the nose, those bumps over the eyes, those are probably being used for display purposes. They're probably being used to help other dinosaurs see who they are and what they are, if that makes sense to all of you guys. Ceratosaurus is big, 23 feet long, weighs about 1,000 pounds. That's very, very big and very heavy. But the um, other amazing thing about Ceratosaurus is that it has armor on its neck and back. It has pieces of bone embedded in the skins called osteoderms these pieces of bone gave it protection now what on earth would a dinosaur as big as ceratosaurus need with protection listen carnivores don't mean they're always safe carnivores can be eaten by other carnivores it happens today let me explain one other thing about carnivores that i failed to say at the beginning Carnivores play an incredibly important role in the history of life, on the life cycle. Planet Earth would not have life if it wasn't for carnivores. Because if there were no carnivores to eat the herbivores, the herbivores could potentially eat all the plants. Plants produce oxygen. There would be limited to no oxygen, so only tiny little things could survive. Because of the carnivores keeping the number of the plant eaters down... They serve a very important role. Something else about carnivores, they're not knee, mean, they're not nasty, they're not hateful. They hunt because they have to hunt. That's how they survive, right? So when a plant-eating animal, a plant-eating dinosaur is looking at a leaf, he's not thinking to himself, oh, baby, I'm going to kill this leaf. No, it's eating it. Well, when meat-eating dinosaurs ate another animal, I don't think they were thinking, oh, this is going to be fun. We're going to kill that guy. That's not the way they were. They're hungry, and they have to eat. Now, somebody did tell me one time, I, they said, I watched a lion, and it had a little gazelle baby, and it was torturing it, chasing it and knocking it down and letting it get up and run. Why is it so mean? Let me explain something about carnivores. They are not playing with their food. They're not having a good time. They're not torturing the animal. They are honing their skills to be able to hunt. That's what they're doing. There's Sometimes you see footage of orcas, killer whales, flipping seals way up into the air and people go man that is so cruel it's not cruel they are practicing their hunting methods they're practicing their hunting methods that's, that's a totally different thing being cruel and torturing an animal is not the same as hunting the animal for food and practicing hunting humans are one of the few animals that actually torture things for fun and it's it's a shameful thing but that's just part of it so getting back to ceratosaurus i just told you he's 23 feet long and he weighs a thousand pounds what would he worry about he would worry about a dinosaur named allosaurus who lived at the same time but was way bigger ceratosaurus is 23 feet long allosaurus is 39 feet long Ceratosaurus weighs 1,000 pounds. Allosaurus weighs 6,000 pounds. This is a monster. And Allosaurus, for everybody that doesn't know, that's my favorite dinosaur. It's the dinosaur that's on my shirt. It's the dinosaur you see everywhere on my truck. Allosaurus is my favorite. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to share a private story with you real quick. When I was little, I loved dinosaurs. I never grew out of my love of dinosaurs. But when I was probably five or six years old, one Christmas, I got a bag of dinosaur toys, and in that, in that bag was an Allosaurus. Now, that Allosaurus toy looked way cooler than the other toys. The other toys didn't look sinister to me. They didn't look scary. They looked kind of—even the T-Rex was kind of—it just didn't look very cool. But that Allosaurus toy looked cool. And every time I played dinosaurs with my family and friends, I was always that Allosaurus because that was my favorite dinosaur. Well, as I grew up, that's the dinosaur I studied the most. That's the dinosaur I loved. Allosaurus became and remained my favorite dinosaur. People ask me, why do you like Allosaurus? It's because one Christmas I got a cool Allosaurus toy. So growing up, I start reading about Allosaurus and I start studying him. And then I learned about a man named Jim Madsen 
who worked at the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry in Utah digging up allosauruses. And he knew a lot about allosaurus, and he became my hero. Well, one time I had the opportunity to fly out to Utah and meet Mr. Madsen. He was the kindest, nicest man you could ever want to meet. And he and I sat there and talked about allosaurus for hours. One of the greatest days in my life. I met a hero, and the hero happened to be everything I hoped he would be. So I learned about Allosaurus. I studied Allosaurus. Well, the first time I ever went dinosaur bone hunting, the very first time I went hunting dinosaur bones, I found a tail vertebra. That's a bone from the tail. And what do you think that bone was? It was an Allosaurus tail vertebra. So the first fossil I ever found, the first dinosaur bone I ever found in my life was a bone from my favorite dinosaur in the world, Allosaurus. Allosaurus is a big dinosaur. Now, his hands are different. You know, when you see these pictures of dinosaurs, like you see pictures of meat eaters and they all kind of sort of look the same, you have to look closer to be able to recognize who's different. Allosaurus has got relatively long arms with three claws. Ceratosaurus had four claws on each hand. Ceratosaurus has bumps over in his eyes, but a bump on the nose. Allosaurus only has the bumps over his eyes. So they are totally different animals. Even though they look similar, they're completely and totally different dinosaurs. So Allosaurus is a big dinosaur, right? Relatively big. Well, well at the time, he was very big. Well, remember we showed you that picture of the Jurassic map, and I said... Dinosaurs could walk everywhere. And I mentioned to you that sometimes we find one dinosaur in one country that almost looks exactly the same as another dinosaur in another country. Here's an example of that. This is Yang Chuanosaurus. Yang Chuanosaurus is very, very closely related to Allosaurus. Very closely related. Why do these two dinosaurs look and act so similar? It's because they are related, because an ancestor traveled from one country to another, and that gave us similar dinosaurs. Yangchuanosaurus, big guy, about the same size as Allosaurus. Megalosaurus is a European monster. Now, this is a dinosaur, a big theropod that lived in Europe, and Megalosaurus is the first dinosaur ever discovered. Megalosaurus was the first dinosaur discovered. Now, maybe early humans found bones of dinosaurs, but they didn't know what they were. But Megalosaurus is the number one first dinosaur ever discovered. Not the first dinosaur that ever lived, but the first dinosaur that was ever named and discovered. He's 30 feet long. He's of same, about the same size as Allosaurus and has similarities. And finally, we'll finish with the Jurassic by talking about a monstrous dinosaur. This is Saurophaganax. Now, Saurophaganax, not, as lot, not a lot is known about it because they found very few fossils. Some paleontologists believe that Saurophaganax is actually just a gigantic Allosaurus. Saurophaganax is way bigger. Allosaurus, I told you, was about 30-something feet long. Saurophaganax may have almost reached 45, maybe even 50 feet that puts Saurophaganax about as big as Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, again, I said very few fossils are found, so nobody can say for sure. But let me tell you this. I believe, and I've said this a number of times in my videos, I believe that the largest theropod would have lived during the Jurassic and not the Cretaceous. I believe this because there were more giant animals back then. Sauropods were back then. And it would seem to me like animals would evolve and adapt to these giant animals dinners by becoming bigger themselves. I think we're going to find, ultimately, one day they will find a dinosaur, and maybe it's Saurophaganax, but one of these carnivores is going to end up being one of the biggest. I sincerely believe that. But the reason why we don't find them is, remember in one of the classes I said that in order to find bones, you have to go where erosion has taken away the layers? Well, there's more places to look for Cretaceous dinosaurs than Jurassic, because Jurassic dinosaur layers are further down, and erosion hasn't gotten to those yet. So we find more Cretaceous dinosaurs than Jurassic. Jurassics are limited, and that's why I don't think we found them yet. So let's jump into the Cretaceous period. Now, now you see the continents have absolutely begun to break apart. But because dinosaurs were able to travel into these places, 
they still have relatives that are now separated by oceans, but they're still there. You still have dinosaurs living in China and Europe and North America and Africa and South America and Antarctica and Australia that are still similar to each other, but they are now separated by distance. One of the reasons why I like the Cretaceous period so much is because of the raptors. This is really the time of raptors. There were some raptor ancestors that show up at the end of the Jurassic, but the Cretaceous is really the age of raptors. That's really where raptors take off. Do any of you remember the scientific term for raptors? Remember I taught this in, in a class last week. Do any of you remember what we call a raptor? Raptor is the nickname. Correct. It is dromaeosaurs. Dromaeosaurs are the, is the true scientific name for dinosaurs that we like to call raptors. Well, dromaeosaurs, what separates them from other dinosaurs are their feet. Their feet are very different. You see from this image that they have one toe that's curved, and that toe can be swung around. Well, look, this is the typical foot of a meat-eating dinosaur. This is what a foot of a carnivore would look like. You guys remember our trick? Five toes. One, two, three, four. And a little tiny one up there makes five. See that tiny little toe right there? It makes five. But they walk on three. Okay, that's the foot of most carnivores. This is the foot of Velociraptor. One of the things you see with Velociraptor is, and you know why I'm having so much trouble moving this? Because the screen I'm looking at is not only backwards, but it's reversed. So this is the foot of Velociraptor. And as you can see, it's got that one curved claw pointing up compared to this other foot, which does not. They still have the same number of toes, but a raptor's foot has a special, a special killing claw we call that the killing claw some people call it the sickle claw so what makes raptors raptors is that foot well there are so many different members of this family i simply cannot give any time to all of them here is an example of the sheer number of different sorts of dromaeosaurs that exist there is bambi raptor micro raptor velociraptor deinonychus uh, ostroraptor pyroraptor dromaeosaurus named for the family a very raptor, Utah raptor, is a big one. Now, there is a new discovery. I haven't had a chance to really study it yet. A new discovery called Dakota raptor that is apparently even bigger than Utah raptor. But I don't know if that's been determined yet or not. I apologize if it has. So for right now, we're going to assume Utah raptor is the biggest member of the Dromaeosaurus family. Let me show you the difference in size. This is the foot of Velociraptor. This is the foot of Utah Raptor. Yes, I would say this is quite a bit bigger. Look at the difference in size between these guys. Utah Raptor, Velociraptor. You know, in the movie Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, they led you to believe that uh, Velociraptors were giant. They're really not. They're not, they're not giant by any stretch. But I want to show you something else. When the dinosaur dies... There was a fingernail covering that covered this. That fingernail covering decomposes and it's gone. So all we see is the bone. Well, somebody made a model of what a Utah Raptor claw would have been like with the sheath, life size. That's the killing claw. Let me put it this way so I'm behind. That's the killing claw of a Utah Raptor. Look at the size difference between little Velociraptor and giant Utah Raptor's claws. So of all of the meat-eating dinosaurs, Velociraptor belongs to the group called dromaeosaurs, and here is an example of some of the different dromaeosaurs. And then let's look at the fastest dinosaurs who happened to live at the Cretaceous period. These were the fastest of all dinosaurs. In my opinion, I think these were the incredibly fastest animals living at the time. Uh, there's a group of them, Ornithomimus, Struthiomimus, Galliomimus, um, Dromisio, or Gallimimus, and Dromisiomimus. These would have been the fastest dinosaurs that ever lived. We call them ostrich dinosaurs. And there is new evidence to suggest that they had feathers as well. That's why the image shows it covered in those feather-like appendages. More and more dinosaurs are being found with uh, feathers, and these would not have been any different. I picked some odd oddities. How weird are these fellows? This is ich Ichthyovenator and Concavenator. 
Concavenator has the weird hump by its hips going back to the tail. Why does he have it? I don't know why you're asking me. I wasn't there back then. The <laughs> We don't know. It could have been used as a sail to attract a mate or threaten a rival. It may have even been used as a way to collect heat from the sun and warm it up. Now, earlier I said they're more like mammals. They don't need the sun to warm up, but sure they do. If it's cold, remember dinosaurs are living, uh, dinosaurs are living all over the planet. There was cold temperatures during the age of dinosaurs. It wasn't all a swamp. It wasn't always muggy. There was cold temperatures. So perhaps they use these as a way to warm up. With ichthyovenator, same thing. It's a weird looking sail thing that's down near the hips. And I just don't understand the placement. Why is it there? Maybe because if it was further along the back, it would have interfered with these guys while they were hunting. Because make no mistake, these are carnivores that are out there hunting. Let's look at some other oddities that show up in the Cretaceous period. That is Cryolophosaurus and Carnotaurus. Cryolophosaurus has a weird looking thing on top of its head that uh, sort of like a little flip looking thing. Carnotaurus has horns. And Carnotaurus also has the smallest hands of any dinosaur that ever lived. His arms are shorter than even T-Rexes. And he has four fingers, by the way. Now I want to show you a mystery dinosaur. These arms. These arms were found, I believe, back in the 19... I want to say the 1960s in Mongolia. All they found were the arms. And nobody could figure out what they belonged to. Most scientists thought they belonged to a dinosaur that looked like Allosaurus, and it was going to be some gigantic, huge, meat-eating monster. Well, it turns out that's what the dinosaur looks like. He's actually more closely related to the ostrich dinosaurs. The mystery dinosaur called uh, Dinochirus is a member of that family. Look at the size of those arms. And by the way, do you know those arms are sitting in my living room right now? <laughs> yes, I have Dinochirus arms in my living room. All right, let's talk about another oddball real quick. That's Therizinosaurus. Now, it belongs to the family of theropods, but this dinosaur may have been an omnivore. But its family, its earliest ancestors were actually carnivores. So that's why he's in this family. Here's the fingernail of that dinosaur. Can you see the size of this fingernail that is the do you know that fingernail is actually as long as my entire arm this is the fingernail of therizinosaurus it was one of the oddest most unusual dinosaurs i have ever seen in my life he's a real oddball now i mentioned earlier how some dinosaurs look like another dinosaur but they're different this is an example of two dinosaurs that are constantly being mistaken for Tyrannosaurus rex. They're very closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex. Despletosaurus, the big one on the top, and Albertosaurus, the other one. These are both very, very large carnivores who did live at the time of Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex would have seen these fellows, but I believe they would have stayed their distance from them because of how big T. rex is. Albertosaurus is 30 feet long and weighed 4,000 pounds. That's very big. That's, that's very big for a dinosaur. Well, Despletosaurus is even larger than that. Just because they look similar to Tyrannosaurus rex doesn't mean they are the same animal. They're just cousins. Think about dogs. Some dogs look similar, but they're different breeds, right? Same thing with those two. And Tyrannosaurus rex, he's called the king of the dinosaurs. I'm not going to give you a lot of details today because I announced earlier that on Friday, April the 10th, I am going to be doing a show dedicated to Tyrannosaurus Rex. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm just going to say it now. I'm going to do a show on Friday, April the 10th on Tyrannosaurus Rex, and I'll give you more details. But I wanted to show you two things on here. One is Tarbosaurus. Why is he on the same page as Tyrannosaurus Rex? Well, that's because Tarbosaurus is the Asian version of Tyrannosaurus Rex. These two dinosaurs are so closely related, some people think they should change the name of Tarbosaurus to Tyrannosaurus Batar. All dinosaurs have a first and last name. All dinosaurs have a first and last name. Tyrannosaurus Rex is the only one everybody calls by its first and last name. You never hear people talking about 
Um, you never hear them say Stegosaurus stenops or Stegosaurus undulatus, Stegosaurus longispinus, Stegosaurus armatus. All four of those dinosaurs are different dinosaurs whose first name is Stegosaurus. You probably have the same name as somebody else you know, but what separates you is you have a different last name. Well, the same thing with dinosaurs. We have dinosaurs who can have the first, the same first name, but a different last name. Well, Tyrannosaurus rex and Tarbosaurus batar are so closely related that some people want the name Tarbosaurus to go away and to be called Tyrannosaurus. So in its case, it would be named Tyrannosaurus batar. And in North America, we would have had Tyrannosaurus rex. But for right now, the name Tarbosaurus, to my understanding, is still a valid name. So there's a lot of debate. Why do you call Tyrannosaurus rex the king? Well, because that's what his name means in English. Tyrannosaurus rex in English means tyrant lizard king. You, he's always going to be called the king of the dinosaurs because his name has the word king in it. But there is a dinosaur that may have been bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex, and that's a dinosaur discovered in South America called Giganotosaurus. Pay special attention to the spelling. When this dinosaur was discovered, a lot of people in the media, that's television and print and radio, a lot of those reporters saw the name Giganotosaurus, were told that it was gigantic, and they accidentally left out the letter O between the N and the T, and they called it Gigantosaurus. But that is not the correct name. Its name is Giganotosaurus, not Gigantosaurus. There is a dinosaur named Gigantosaurus, but it's a sauropod. It's a long-necked dinosaur. Giganotosaurus is the proper way to... Now, uh, you can call it Giganotosaurus if you like. That's something else I want to cover. How you pronounce a dinosaur's name, there's not a rule in place that says how you're supposed to say it. Some people say um, uh, gigantus, I mean, I'm sorry, giganotosaurus. Some say giganotosaurus. Some say compsonathus. Some say compsognathus. Some say diplodocus. Some say diplodocus. There is not necessarily a right and wrong way. Think about words today. Some say Caribbean. Some say Caribbean. It's perfectly fine. Tomato, tomato. I think I'll start singing. So when you hear me pronounce a name that you might pronounce differently, like I say Ankylosaurus and some people say Ankylosaurus, it's because there's different ways to pronounce these names. So you are not saying it wrong and I'm not saying it right. It's just how we pronounce it. So Giganotosaurus, some people believe it grew bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex. Some believe it was smaller. But because they haven't found enough evidence to absolutely determine the length, we may not know. One other thing about estimating the size of a dinosaur, when all you got is bones, how do you do that? How close were the bones together, like the vertebra? Were they separated, and was there a piece of cartilage between it? How thick was that cartilage? Because if I have 20 tail bones that are together, my tail is a certain length. But if I have a big piece of cartilage between it, then every bone has that distance, and the next thing you know, it's much larger than you thought it was. Well, that's what's going on between Tyrannosaurus rex and Giganotosaurus. Who was the longest of the two? We cannot say with any certainty. Most of the people I know in, in the world of paleontology believe Giganotosaurus was bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex. But for you T-Rex lovers, have no fear. Because just because Giganotosaurus might have been longer... He was nowhere near as powerful. Tyrannosaurus rex is a monster. Giganotosaurus is big, but Tyrannosaurus rex is incredibly powerful. So if those two dinosaurs met, which they didn't because they didn't live at the same time, I would put my money on the king of the dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, and Giganotosaurus would come in last. Okay, so who is the biggest theropod? Who is the biggest meat-eating dinosaur? Well... If it's based on height and length, it is Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus is longer and taller than Tyrannosaurus rex. Taller only because T. rex does not have the big sail on its back. Spinosaurus is tall because of that sail. If you take away that sail, it's not as tall as Tyrannosaurus rex. Spinosaurus is a real mystery. And if you'll notice, there are two different images here. The image on the top 
is the one that um, is the one that we always think of as what Spinosaurus looked like. But we don't know a lot about Spinosaurus because it was discovered, blown up, and rediscovered. What? Yes. During World War II, a bomber dropped its bombs and actually blew up the museum where the only Spinosaurus bones were being housed. They were blown to pieces. There was nothing left of them. And so scientists only had to base all their knowledge or what they thought they knew about Spinosaurus on a few of the images, pictures, that were left over from the bones that had been blown to pieces. Well, recently, a paleontologist discovered a new skeleton of Spinosaurus, and this is why the sail looks different than the original sail. Scientists thought the original sail was just this big, round, top-looking thing, but new evidence suggests it had a different shape. There's another debate about Spinosaurus, and that is, was Spinosaurus standing up and walking on its back legs, or was Spinosaurus walking on four legs? Now, let me say for the record that we know from the evidence Spinosaurus was a pescivore. That means it eats fish because they find fish scales and fish bones in the stomach areas of Spinosaurus and its cousins. Spinosaurus had cousins. He had Megaraptor, Baryonyx, Suchomimus, and Irritator. Those are all same member of that family. And all of them are found with fossilized fish scales in their stomach area. So that's not a coincidence. That means they're eating fish. Their nose is made for grabbing fish. Their teeth are made for grabbing fish. Even their hands might have been made for slapping and grabbing a fish. I don't know. So if it's eating fish, then it's spending most of its time in the water. And if it's catching fish, then you want your head to be closer to the water because you're able to grab a fish easier. So did it stand on four legs or did it stand on two? I do not know the answer to that question, unfortunately, because there's not enough evidence, in my opinion, to know with absolute certainty. All right, you guys, um, that is it for this class. Keep in mind that on this coming Friday, April 3rd, I will be doing a class on forensic fossils. That's where I will show you how scientists use modern forensics technology to study. Then on April 7th, same time as all these classes. All these classes start at 10, 10 a.m. Central Time. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. On April 7th, um, there is a, I'm teaching a class on prehistoric mammals. And then on Friday, April the 10th, I will teach a class on Tyrannosaurus Rex. And if they extend the quarantine and you can't get back to school, then I will try the following week to do another class on animal adaptation. All right, um, answering questions. Now, here is the problem, everyone. I cannot, for some reason, access the questions. For some reason, I cannot access them. I can only see like one or two, and I can't see anybody else's comments. So I am unfortunately not going to be able to answer any questions on this particular class. I am so very sorry I can't. But um, for those of you that, that prefer to watch this on another uh, format, I will post this on YouTube as well and make it a YouTube video. Until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. I hope you are all doing okay. I hope you enjoyed this class. I hope you learned something. Thank you all so very much, and have a good day, everybody, and we'll see you again. I'll see you on Friday. Forensic Fossils. See you then.